but there's not a whole lot of dudes that are taking accountability. You know, I fucked up bad, bad, like crash and burn type shit, hurt a lot of people. And, um, and I'm fully aware of that and I'm gonna owe for the rest of my life. Uh, the way that I felt about craft and life in general was, I don't give a fuck what you think, you know? I don't care what you think about me. I had come from an environment where very little um, cheerleading going on. And so I created a sort of uh, survival instinct right. where I would cut people out, you know, and, and minimize opinions. And the way that I would do that is I had to, I had to, believe that my opinion was greater than everybody else's opinion around me. Man, we got to get to the root of what the fuck is going on here. You know, something wrong with you. You know, let's get well. I, I wasn't listening to no therapy. I had been therapized my whole life that it felt like you want me to focus on the problem? Well, how am I going to like, how am I going to hack this mm. focusing on the mm. problem thing? Mm. And how am I going to find my way back to this hustle so I can get back to my ego? Because mm. really all I cared about was my ego. I didn't give a fuck about getting well. Yeah. You know, it was all about get well for you. Yeah. Get well for the camera for me to experience ego death. You can't run no more. You got to let go. You gotta let go in full. And I wanna get in my car and I drive up to Utah. And I'm in Utah for three months. And while I'm in Utah, it allows me, it gives me, they take my cell phone from me. And if they didn't take my cell phone from me, I was never gonna be able to deal with what I needed to deal with. I had never known how to pray because I could never cultivate silence. I had no absence in my life. Every unforgiving minute was full of some scroll or some more like ego feed, constant, non-stop rotation of this this ego thing and that ego thing and bop, 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 just constant fulfillment of like my own personal desires and they took my phone from me. And just for that reason alone, I would I would urge anybody to go this route if you're in a situation like mine, just to get the phone out of your pocket. And what that gave me was time to like really assess what had been my operating systems, what had been like the motivational force in my life, which was always me. It was always ego. It was even always the smallest decision. The smallest decision to even going to everything, food. Everything, everything you eat. Everything, every, everything yeah, was yeah. ego. Everything was ego. I, I would eat that not because it tasted good, but because it would do this or do that, you know? And um, when do you become a man? When you get a driver's license? Like, what do we do? You're 16, we give you a driver's license. Okay, well, wait, like, you get a job? Like, when do you become a man? You become a man when you become responsible for other people. And part of that is taking accountability. I grew up on a, in a culture that told me going to war made you a man. Going to prison, yeah, coming back, coming back makes you a man. Um, making a million dollars makes you a man, you know, and, and it doesn't. And you don't know it till you didn't, did, done all these things and realized I'm oh, still baby. a little f***ing boy. Or been around people who've been there a bunch of times. Also, my definition of warrior has changed. Me too. Like, you know, I didn't really know what that meant. And really, it's about bringing others back. And that's my whole f mission, dog, really. It's just to, like, dudes who've been where I've been or something similar, just know it gets better. It does. Like, it, it doesn't make no sense. It doesn't make no sense. It's irrational. It doesn't make any sense on paper that I could have joy in abundance in my life, that I could feel any kind of joy in my life after being what I've been. Pain is an adhesive, bro. If you've been yeah. through it, yeah. you can connect to people, period, end yeah. of story. You know, I had no love in my life. I had no purpose in my life. My whole purpose, as you know, was just craft. Mm. It was just, I'm gonna be good at this thing, and that's all that I have. And that's such a vapid, shallow existence. And he said, welcome to AA. And he said, I need you to go home and clear out, like clear the decks. And I'm like, nah, man, like for me, and I don't know if you felt this way, but every woman was the one for me. There was never a two. If you liked me, you were the one. Uh, and that had to do with my insecurity and my fear. And he's like, uh, well, look, man, I'll tell you what, you know, you can keep doing it your way or you can try some new shit because the way that you're living, you're doomed is what he said. You're doomed. That was the word. And, um, I flipped to this page, he made me flip to this doctor's opinion, we got in our book, and in the doctor's opinion, or how our book starts, it, it mentions the word doomed. And he's like, this isn't like another AA guy, this is a doctor telling you you're doomed, if you don't figure this shit out. And uh, he goes, to put it in perspective, if you went to Kaiser Permanente right now, 
and they sat you down and put your, you know, x-rayed you and put your, your x-ray up on a light board and you're looking at a picture of your clavicle and the doctor said, hey man, you see that, that gray spot just above your chest cavity? You're doomed. And you wouldn't be thinking about the job that you got to get to or the girl you got to hold on to or where you're going to go on the, for Father's Day or what the, you immediately your whole life would get very small. And the only rational response to that kind of information is, well, what do I do? That made sense to me. He puts me in a car. He says, I need you to listen to Sandy Beach tape. Now, at this point in my life, like I'm 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 like barely hanging on and I'm I'm using this woman like drugs. You know, every time I need validation, I'm having like. I'm with this woman and and she becomes with the job, the mask of success that the job created for me, which kept me from like really looking at myself. She became that for me in the interim. And he's like, you got to get rid of all of it. You know, there is no more work and no more romance for for a year. You're going to have to give me a year. And I'm thinking, like, I'm not going to be able to pull that off, you know, and right away I'm half measuring. And this is my wiggle room. I, I can't. And uh, he says. I need you to download this tape, this Sandy Beach tape. Sandy Beach is a, a, a big speaker. Uh, uh, and in, in this, in this, what was in, the speech? Yeah, the speech was he was talking about this this Chinese farmer, and uh, this Chinese farmer and his son they're picking radishes about the ground, and they don't own the land that they're farming off of, and uh, they're barely subsisting. They're giving seventy percent to the landowner. They're living off of thirty percent of these radishes. Their whole financial legacy is tied up into this workhorse. And one day, and the son is really working the land because the man is too old. And one day the workhorse runs up off the hill. He, he just, and the son runs into the house and he shakes his dad up and he says, dad, you're not gonna believe this is a, this is a travesty. We're gonna die out here. Uh, I can't get these radishes to grow unless I turn this land over and I can't move that hoe without the horse and the horse is gone. This is a nightmare. And the old man nonplus looks at his son. He goes, I don't know what this is, son. I don't know if it is a nightmare, I can't call it. And the son thinks his dad's out to lunch yeah. or like ambivalent or something's wrong or he's too old. And a couple days later, the kid is chilling on the porch and he sees the horse running down the hill with 50 wild stallions behind it. And they run into the paddock and he locks the paddock and he runs inside and he hits the dad. He's like, man, this is radishes. Like we're rich, you know, we're, we're in the horse business. We're in the horse trading business now. This is a miracle, dad. I'm gonna go tell everybody we're trading horses now. And the father looks at his son nonplussed again and says, I don't know what this is. I don't know if it's a miracle, I can't call it. And a couple more days pass and the son's trying to break these horses down, domesticate these horses. He didn't know anything about horses, he's a radish farmer. So uh, one of the horses ain't having it. He rears up, kicks him in his leg. It's like 1400s China, there's no Kaiser Permanente, it's shattered. They wrap him in some like tobacco leaves and some, sprinkle some mint on it, go sit in a chair for a while. And, uh, and he's wailing and the townspeople hear about it and the townspeople run up on the little shack and oh man, what are you gonna do? You know, you can't domesticate these horses. You can't move this hoe. You guys are fully, I don't know what you're gonna do, but this is, this is pretty much the end, right? Like this is a nightmare. And the old man says, I don't know what this is. He looks at his son's leg. He goes, I don't know what this is. I can't, I can't really call it. Uh, a couple more days pass. He's sitting with his son. He's trying to calm him down. He's in the middle of pain and they hear this thunderous noise and they look up on the ridge line and they see 5,000 samurai on horseback running towards their little hut. And the commanding officer gets off his horse and says, give us your son, we're going to fight the Maoist army. And he looks at his son's leg and he looks back at the samurai army and he goes, I, I would, but he can't get out the chair. You know, he, he, he can't get on his, he, he can't. No, I can't. I would, but I can't, he's crippled. And the man gets back on his horse and 8,000 men ride off to their death. And I listen to this tape and and I, I, I'm driving back from the beach, back to where I'm living, and I get out of my car and her bags are packed. She's on her way out. And something in me from having heard what I just heard, what feels like this is, this is now I can't get no lower. I hear this like, I can't call it. And this, it becomes like this, the most diplomatic breakup I ever had in my life. And I say, what can I do? And, she, and uh, can I get you a car? And she goes, no, don't worry about it, go get well. Now, now I, I don't need to be anything. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be a certain this or a certain that to have permission mm -hmm. to have friends mm -hmm. um, or a wife mm -hmm. or, or anything. Mm -hmm. Like I, I deserve it. Mm -hmm. And that's a hard thing to, to, to say that you deserve love when on paper, no, you don't. So I was there for, for, for 90 days and in that 90 days I, I uh, I made a list of all these people that I hurt. And, and um, 
I mean, a bunch of shit happened, but uh, I came out and um, just hit the ground running, trying to make amends, trying to right these wrongs. And this is also still a part of that. There's some people who don't want to talk to me, you know, yeah. and uh, and I understand that. And so my purpose now is to be patient. 